I'm the chair of the NPC Newsmakers Committee, and our news conference this morning deals with a growing problem in the United States, human sex trafficking, especially the trafficking of young children. Uh, it's not only a, a social problem, it's become a major problem for local law enforcement and local government. On our panel, our panel this morning is going to discuss the growth of human sex trafficking and ways to combat it. And our panel includes Texas Congressman Ted Poe, who is the author of the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act, which will be marked up tomorrow. Uh, the congressman is under a, 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 a tight deadline this morning, so he is going to leave after he makes his remarks. Um, and we'll turn the program then over to Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors Chairman Don Knabi. He's become a leading national voice on the issue of child sex trafficking and a major supporter of the CASE Act, uh, which increased prison terms for traffickers, which required traffickers to register as sex offenders, uh, mandated special training for law enforcement to deal with sex trafficking uh, issues and incidents, and it requires traffickers to pay criminal fines to help cover the cost of services to their victims. Um, and this morning, uh, uh, Chairman Kanabi is going to uh, deliver the results of a survey on this issue uh, by the National Association of Counties, um, uh, and uh, uh, which outlines where the growth is and where the where the problems are. Uh, and finally, we're going to hear from Jessica M. She is a trafficking survivor who suffered years of sexual and physical abuse. She now works in the Los Angeles County Probation Department, where she mentors young people who've been sexually exploited, and supports girls who are testifying in open court against uh, their traffickers. And Congressman Poe, the microphone is yours, sir. Thank you, Herb. Thanks for uh, inviting me to come uh, today and be here. Uh, also, uh, Jessica, thank you for being here. And uh, Don, uh, all your work uh, that you do on this uh, scourge that is uh, taking place uh, human trafficking. Uh, what do we mean by human trafficking? Human trafficking is the kidnapping, hostage taking of people, taking them one, from one place to another for sexual slavery. And it occurs in the world. It occurs uh, in many places. I was uh, recently uh, in Central America and visited several shelters there all uh, shelters that are taking care of child sexual assault victims that had been trafficked. In fact, uh, a young girl by the name of Lily gave me this bracelet and asked me to wear it. And at her shelter, they make these bracelets and then they're sold in the area to try to get money for the shelter. Many shelters do that throughout the world. And uh, I talked to her and many other victims about what happened to them. International sex trafficking of children occurs in a particular country, but it, they're also transported from one country to the other. And now they're being transported uh, from many countries to the United States. Both children and adults, primarily females, are being transported. But yes, it does occur to minor uh, boys as well. I'm from Houston, Texas. Uh, in my prior life, I was a prosecutor and a judge. And uh, unfortunately, Houston, Texas now uh, is one of the hubs, if not the hub in the United States for sex trafficking to take place. Because of our location uh, next to the uh, international border with Mexico, the Gulf, the s size of Houston, etc. And uh, women, primarily, are trafficked to Houston and then sent to other parts of the United States. So we're facing two issues in this country. The international sex trade that is being brought into the United States. But we also have domestic trafficking of uh, children, primarily, that are being trafficked across the United States. Domestic trafficking of uh, people who have been held hostage uh, by the trafficker. The trafficker is nothing more than a slave holder. Uh, human trafficking is modern day slavery. It fits all the definitions of slavery 
And many times those of us um, in the community don't want to talk about that, but that's exactly what it is. All you have to do is talk to victims and they will tell you that they fit the definition of being a slave by the slave master. And uh, why is the sex trafficking of minors and adults uh, occurring? It's occurring because it's all about the money. Uh, the sex trade of trafficking of children and adult women occurs like this. There's money involved. In the international drug trafficking, uh, that is still the number one um, organized crime uh, money-making uh, entity in the world. But close behind is the trafficking of people for sex. And the reason it's such a big money maker is for two reasons. And why it's taking place is for two reasons. One, it's a big money maker. Unlike drugs, drugs are sold one time. In the trafficking business, the slave master sells a victim more than once, sometimes up to 20 times a day in our cities throughout the country. Second reason, the punishment is less. The consequences, the risk. We go after those carteled guys and the people bringing in those drugs and we capture them uh, and they go to prisons, as they should. But the risk for the trafficker is less. And for those two reasons, it's increasing. So we want to address both of those reasons uh, as we progress. Um, we've introduced, I say we, Carolyn Maloney and I have introduced uh, the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act. Carolyn Maloney is a, a New York Democrat. I am a Texas Republican. Never the twain shall meet. <laughs> Uh, and uh, as Churchill said about the United States and England, uh, Carolyn Maloney and I are separated by a common language. Uh, we don't agree on a whole lot. We do agree on many things. But uh, you find this bipartisan bill, and it is bipartisan. We have over 80 members, Republicans and Democrats, on this piece of legislation. Uh, it, is a, it is a human rights issue that we have to deal with in the United States and the sooner the better. And what is happening to victims, um, there are many stories. You have written about many of these stories of victims where victims are branded. You know, we brand cattle in Texas um, and they're treated like cattle. And women are being branded in the United States and trafficked. They're branded by the slaveholder. He, he puts a mark on them some way so that other traffickers know this is his property. Brands are used for property. And um, even recent news reports about in New York, uh, one trafficker is putting barcodes on his victims that he sells. Uh, that's what's taking place. And so we have the trafficker on one end. Generally, the laws in the United States do a pretty good job of punishing that person. We have good, pretty good laws. But there are two other folks that need to be, uh, we need to be aware of in the, the trafficking trade. On the other end, and really I think the most important, is the victim. And let's talk about child victims of trafficking. You hear the phrase child prostitution. There cannot be a such thing as child prostitution. Prostitution connotes the idea that there's consent involved. Children cannot consent to sex. So they are not prostitutes. They are victims of criminal conduct. So we have to change the mindset in this country to treat these victims as victims and not child prostitutes, not just treat them as runaways and throwaways and stowaways. They are victims of crime. And we need to rescue them, rescue them. What happens in many cases, and no offense to law enforcement, what happens in many cases, police officer working the beat, sees a child on the, on the streets, and she's arrested for uh, child prostitution. The reason is because they have no place to take th that child. She's a victim. There are no places for victims in many, many situations. So to, for her safety, they put her in the juvenile justice system. 
that is not healthy for the long-term mental health of the victim is to put them immediately in the, ju the criminal justice system. We should treat them like what they are, victims. We have to work on that end, and I'll address that in the bill momentarily. Rescue them, restore them, but treat them like victims and not like criminals. Once again, child prostitution cannot exist because of the very nature. It's not consent. They don't, legally cannot consent. And then in the middle, you have the demand. Unfortunately, there's a high demand. That's why there's so much money involved in this uh, scourge. These people in the, in the middle should be treated like who they are. We use the phrase John. Why do we use that phrase? I mean, John, he's in the Bible. He was a good guy. Why, we shouldn't be calling them Johns. We should call them what they are. They're child abusers. They're sexual predators. They're child rapists. Any of those fit because they are... Consent, once again, is not the issue. It's, we need to identify who these folks are. And basically, and federally across the country, these folks have been getting away with that type of conduct. So we have the victim, we have the child abuser, and we have the trafficker. So Carolyn Maloney's bill and mine uh, does three things. It, go, it, it deals with each of those. The victim, uh, there will be... Uh, um, Law enforcement and victim shelters will be able to obtain grants to help rescue and restore. The money is not as much as I would want it to be, but it's a start. We need more money for them because we've got a lot of folks in the country doing good work. Just a few years ago, Shared Hope International had this statistic. In our country, we have 5,000 animal shelters. I mean, I love animal shelters. I have Dalmatians, and I got one of them from Dalmatian Rescue. Although I do call my Dalmatians the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, I love those animal shelters. They do good work. But beds for child trafficked victims just a couple of years ago was less than 300. So we have 300 beds in the United States or less. And that's just an average. And we have a lot of more care for animals. Nothing wrong with that. We just need to bring this one up. So that's where the, the key is, finding places for those kids. And they're hard victims to work with. They're not easy to work with. And some of you hopefully can understand why, you know, they've had their life shattered at such a very young age. Uh, they're difficult. The second thing it does is go after the demand, the child abuser. The days of boys being boys is over. The consumer, we, we will know who you are, the public will know who you are, and you will be prosecuted. You'll be prosecuted almost to the extent as the trafficker himself. So it's a federal issue because these girls are moved across state lines. The Internet is used. So there's, uh, that's the reason. And that's what the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act does. Those three things, uh, rest restore and uh, recover and restore the victim, prosecute the demand because it's the demand that's driving the money and then put the slave master behind bars also where they belong. And uh, I appreciate your attention. So thank you very much for uh, letting me be here, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now uh, Los Angeles County uh, Chairman Don Canabe. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Herb and uh, Congressman Paul, I appreciate you uh, being here and taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm Los Angeles County Supervisor Don Kanabi. I'm currently the chair of the Board of Supervisors of Los Angeles County, the, the largest county in America. And um, as I said, I'm pleased to be here with uh, Congressman Poe and most importantly, uh, my friend and hero, Jessica, over here. And uh, you're going to do just fine. Today, I'm going to share with you a, a, a survey about human trafficking that the National Association of Counties, uh, NACO, conducted recently and then discuss uh, some of the things that we've done in Los Angeles County uh, and to address this. As I tell people, it's probably the most horrific issue that I've ever been involved with in my political career. I, I've never dealt with anything worse than this. Just three years ago, uh, I was briefed by 
uh, two young women in our probation department about a growing issue uh, occurring right in our own backyard. Uh, girls, uh, some as young as 12 years old, were being bought and sold on the streets of Los Angeles County and the region. And like so many, uh, I just want to assure you, this is not just an issue happening over there, uh, but happening right in our own communities. This NACO survey uh, results uh, also show that this is not just an issue with Los Angeles County. As the Congressman indicated, and I think when I testified in front of you in the Foreign Affairs Committee last year, I think there were a lot of recognition that's just not a, a local issue. But this is a problem across America, particularly uh, large urban counties. To determine the extent of the problem, NACO engaged uh, National Research, Inc. of Washington, D.C. to conduct this survey of county sheriffs, county police chiefs during the month of April. A total of 400 counties provided responses. The counties were broken down into three categories, large counties with population over 250,000, mid-sized counties 50,000 to 250,000, and small counties under 50,000. The survey results showed that human sex trafficking is a problem across the entire United States. 86% of the large counties said it's a problem, while 53% of mid-sized counties also identified it as an issue. So when it comes to the trafficking of minors, 40% of our large counties said it has increased over the past two years. And for these larger counties, it was a problem that is not going away, they said. 34% said arrest for human sex trafficking in the past year has increased. The survey also showed that sellers and purchasers of sex are the groups that are most often arrested for child sex trafficking. This may be due to recent safe haven laws across the nation that prevent minors from being arrested for prostitution. The survey also showed that there is a link between sex trafficking and minor children who have been in our foster care system. Group homes are involved in uh, domestic violence or abuse proceedings. 62% of our large counties said there was a strong or somewhat strong link. We have certainly seen this in, in Los Angeles County, where at last year over 80% of the minors brought, into our, brought in on prostitution charges were already known to us, either through our foster care or juvenile justice system. Clearly, clearly much more needs to be done to identify vulnerable minors and put prevention programs in place. The county surveyed uh, believed that the providing a safe shelter or transitional housing is needed to combat, combat this sex trafficking and to help children who are victims. And it's probably the, the number one piece as it relates to the financial piece to all of this is the safe havens and housing, uh, as Jessica will address. Protecting young children and keeping them safe from their, it says here, pimps. But uh, again, it's a recognition that we don't want to even use that word, uh, just rapist, or whatever you want to call them other than, because that word has been glorified. It's a huge challenge for all of us and something for which we need to find solutions and funding. I, I want to, a couple of shout outs, uh, thank Matt Chase and NACO for conducting the survey. And we do have a detailed report for all of you that will be available. So across the nation, our eyes uh, are finally open to the fact that minors are being trafficked in our streets and across state lines. While we have a long way to go to end this issue, I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish over the past three years in Los Angeles County, uh, the largest in the nation, as I mentioned. I told you about two of the women that came to my office to raise this issue with me, and, uh, and one of them is here today, Michelle Guyman, he's out here, who has done an extraordinary job and made LA County a leader in combating this horrific crime. For us in Los Angeles County, it started with building awareness, and it started with building awareness with myself. I would argue that there is some public knowledge of human trafficking, but to most people, it is happening over there, as I mentioned earlier, in some distant foreign country, not here in our own communities. So we began our efforts with a focus on several levels of outreach. As a member of the board, a supervisor, I also sit on a member of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Over two years ago, we lost a campaign to post information in multiple languages about sexually trafficked youth on all of our 3,600 metro buses and our rail cars, our trains, its stations, all Metrolink trains, which the Metrolink is a system that I also sit on that crosses county borders, to shine a light on this travesty in, in, in the places where we believe young people are most vulnerable. And public transportation is a vehicle that they, that they use to, to, to move these young ladies. 
two weeks we and two weeks later we launched uh, uh, two weeks ago we launched a follow-up campaign um, to focus on our young victims the county of Alameda is in Northern California again they created this particular billboard campaign and generously shared it with us and that's what I always encourage everyone it's a good use of resources we didn't have to recreate the reel as we you know took it to a, to a higher level this was the original program that we had and this is the new program and I just want to thank uh, Alameda County again for sharing this with us it's also been very pleased that the private sector supported our efforts on both campaigns we had clear channel and Lamar advertising have donated hundreds of billboards we also created a video called manipulated to tell the story of child sex trafficking through the eyes of a survivor and an undercover officer it's had over 82,000 hits and it's been viewed in over 171 countries and we have copies available in the back as well so raising awareness however is not just about the public through a federal grant that Michelle and Hanya were able to get, we have trained over 5,000 people, including judges, attorneys, community partners, county staff, and other stakeholders who regularly come in contact with victims. Similarly, we would like to help medical professional in emergency rooms, another uh, chasing point uh, in ERs, and uh, we would like to, uh, you know, also on the rape crisis centers, uh, help identify victims. So through this federal grant, we also establish a collaborative court to focus specifically on the victims of child sex trafficking. It's an isolated courtroom. In the past, children arrested for prostitution were often released, given a slap on the wrist, back out into the parking lot, into the hands of their scumbag dude, right outside the courthouse door. Bang. Through the court, we are now able to provide young girls with a victim-centered response team to help them with their physical as well as their mental health issues and to support them with housing, education, and training services. I'd like to thank the uh, head of that court, Commissioner Catherine Pratt, who is here with us today as well, uh, for her incredible work uh, and dedication uh, to the victims. And I don't, <clears throat> until I can describe it in great detail, but until you go into that courtroom, and see the commissioner and others, the team around these young girls operate, uh, it's, it's an absolutely amazing scenario. So, Commissioner, I really appreciate you making the trek out here. Los Angeles County has hosted two of the first ever national empowerment conferences for the victims and at-risk girls to help them overcome their challenges, uh, heal their wounds, and look towards the future. I'd also like to uh, thank one of our survivors who's here today, Christina, for sharing her story uh, to help these young ladies. Of course, Helping the victims is critical, but we also must find ways to prevent this atrocity altogether. We have developed a curriculum that we are using in probation halls called My Life, My Choice, and hope to bring that into selected middle schools where we know exploitation is at its highest. So while survivor and prevention programs are fundamental, legislative action is necessary to punish the true criminals and defend the victims. I would like to uh, thank Judge Poe and Congressman Poe for who I met earlier, as I mentioned uh, last year. Also to thank the California delegation and especially Congresswoman Bass for their support and this bipartisan support for his key legislation, that and on other bills which will fight this horrific crime. Um, earlier this year, I joined with a bipartisan group. And there's even bipartisanship in the state legislature right now in California. I, standing behind me together, and uh, they have a number of bills and, uh, to support a war on child sex trafficking, a legislative package that could have immediate and strong impact, up to and including uh, you know, having sex trafficking called a, a, a gang crime, uh, allowing wiretapping and other issues. And this is coming from those that may not be a purveyor of wiretapping, but with this horrific crime, they're advocating on both sides of the aisle. So it's gonna change the way we prosecute and punish the sex buyers, including longer jail times and increased fines. But I strongly believe, uh, again, that the scumbags that are responsible for the rape and torture of these young girls for their personal profit should have nothing but the entire book thrown in a, in a court of law. It's been three years since we started on this journey in Los Angeles County, and I'm proud of what our county staff, uh, through the original efforts of uh, Michelle and Hanya, and 
our entire team, what we've been able to accomplish over the last few years. I'm pleased that people are becoming more aware that aggressive efforts are underway now to prevent this horrific crime. Uh, we need the support of our federal partners like Congressman Poe and others to increase penalties and funding for services for the victims. We see through this NACO survey results that this is a national issue that must be addressed. And as we see patterns in child sex trafficking across geography, we also must develop models for protection and prevention by working together across all levels of government. The voices of these abused children often remain silent. In the past, uh, young girls arrested for prostitution were judged by society exactly as their scumbag pimps predicted. That life, outrageously, the pimp life, has been celebrated, and I think that's why we want to eliminate that word. So through education, survivor and prevention programs, and legislation, uh, we, will, we will reverse this injustice. Young girls, those who are responsible to protect, will know that no matter where they are from or how they've been trafficked, they are the true victims. We will be here to their, for their support to help them realize that their lives are valuable and, most importantly, that they are worthy of the dreams they once imagined. So we must do everything we can do to get these girls off track and onto a path of a better life. Together we can say, no more, not in our streets, not to our young girls. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you to Congressman Poe, Supervisor Kanabi, and all of you who fight for the young victims of child sex trafficking. My name is Jessica, and I was exploited beginning at the, of the age of 11, and was arrested several times across the United States before the age of 21. For a lot of young women like me, trauma began at an early age. Before the commercial sexual exploitation, abuse was a major factor in most of our childhoods. In my case, I was raped, beaten, and mentally abused from three to 11 years old by a number of men. I was not yet in the street or being posted online, but this was happening constantly in my home environment. Girls are abused at home and run to the streets desperate for love and attention, or even sometimes for basic needs like shelter and food. As the survey results show, many young girls enter the world of sexual exploitation from the child welfare system. It is the same pattern happening across the United States over and over. Pimps are waiting to prey on these most vulnerable girls, promising to, uh, the love and family they never had. Once coerced into exploitation, these false promises turn into violence and physical and emotional manipulation. The girls are told that they are now dirty and disgusting and no one will love them except the pimp. We believe it. We are, we are reminded that no one will believe us anyway. In my case, one of my buyers was from my school. He was a prestigious dean, and I knew that no one would believe that just a few nights before, he followed, stalked, and harassed me to get into his car. So I didn't tell anybody. He was in his 40s, and I was only 14 years old. Like so many of our young girls, I felt I had no voice. Our buyers, um, our buyers are law enforcement, lawyers, doctors, and business owners. Why would anybody believe us that these types of respected people are doing despicable things to us? This story is not unique to me or to Los Angeles County. In fact, I was trafficked from Hollywood, California to Hollywood, Florida, in Arizona, Nevada, Texas, and even right across from the White House on K Street. In big cities, small towns, and truck stops in between. It is hard to think about being on a plane or a bus with my exploiter, and either people wouldn't pay attention or would look at me and stare at me in disgust. No one ever call, asked me if I needed help or called the authorities because something didn't look right. This mindset has led to the penalty system that we see today. When I was being victimized by my traffickers, there was never a shortage of sex buyers ready to purchase me. The sex buyers appeared very unconcerned about being caught or facing any consequences whatsoever. 
The individuals I saw getting arrested mo most often were victims just like me. Like many young ladies, I was considered the criminal. Names were attached to me. And yet the men who bought and sold me and so many other young girls too often get off without penalties or even consequences. The legislation being discussed today is a first step in righting these wrongs. It's time for the real criminals to pay for exploiting young girls. And it's time for the young victims to get the services they need to move forward in their lives to get the things that they deserve. Our girls and women have to live every day of our lives with the trauma and shattered self-worth of all that has happened to us at the hands of our exploiters. The buyers get a slap on the wrist, maybe a small fine, and worst of all, sometimes John's school. Like raping a young girl is the same as going to traffic school for a speeding ticket. We live with reoccurring nightmares. We live with people always branding us as prostitutes. We have to live with the fact that it is almost impossible to trust anyone because of what has been done to us by the hands of our exploiters. That is why funding for services for young victims is so important. They need everything from ongoing therapy for the emotional trauma, to health care for the physical trauma, to coping classes and basic life skills. I remember trying to turn on electricity for my new apartment, and I had no idea of whom to call or how to get it turned on, period. <laughs> um, these types of wraparound services must be funded. Today, I work with Los Angeles County Probation Department to help heal young girls that face similar circumstances to mine. We have a dedicated courtroom for sexually exploited youth. And I often sit side by side with a young girl as she heroically stands up to testify in a system that has only let her down. I continue to be amazed by the resiliency of these young girls and how hopeful they are despite the trauma and how they are still children who need protection. Let me be clear, there is no such thing as a child prostitute. The word prostitute brings up specific images and stigmas. Just as the words child abuse victim or rape victim bring up certain sympathetic, uh, more sympathetic response, prostitute devalues the violence, harm, and trauma that an exploited child is subjected to. And remembering that they are children, I would like to ask your help in one final area. Please don't call me or anyone else, any of these young girls, prostitutes. We already feel enough guilt and shame. We already feel different, dirty, and disconnected from the normal population. The danger of referring to exploited children as prostitutes gives the, percep the perception that consent was involved. Trust me, no 12-year-old would ever, ever in life choose this particular, this type of life. I've given numerous print and TV interviews in the last few years only to read in the paper the following day that I was labeled as a prostitute or a former prostitute. It hurts. That is not who I am. It doesn't begin to describe that I was an 11-year-old that was put out there to be bought and sold by many men. When I continue to be labeled that way, it takes away all that I endured at a very young age and what I continue to struggle with every day. I have survived the things that were done to me, and now I'm not just a survivor, but an advocate for thousands of young girls across the country who have no voice or protection. We need your help to make people aware this is happening right here in our streets. If people see something, they should say something. They may just save a life. We need your help to increase the penalties and to bring shame on those who buy and sell young girls. We need your help for funding the wraparound services for victims who have survived this hell and who need your help to achieve the dreams that they deserve. On behalf of them, I wanna say thank you for paying attention and for caring and for telling those who buy young girls for, se for sex that we are not for sale. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you for having us. And I just want you to know, you know why now she's my hero. That's, that's, you got to be strong to do what she just did. <laughs>